NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. Happy August, National Writing Project friends and family, and welcome to another episode of The Right Time, the video and radio podcast that brings together phenomenal writers and the teachers who love to teach them. Welcome to the 2023-2024 school year. I'm Brian Ripley Crandall, and the toes I've been dipping in the sandy and salty water of the Long Island Sound are slowly getting used to the socks and shoes of classrooms again. Ugh. I'm marking myself safe, however. <laughs> From the flesh-eating bacteria that kept so many of us away from paddleboarding this past week. And to be honest, I'm not sure how I'm feeling about any of this, but that's okay, because my beliefs and principles vary most of the time, which is part of today's conversation. I do know, however, I know I love working with Tanya Baker, Director of National Programs. We've been away for a short while because of the summer obligations, but we're back. She's still beautiful, and we're heading towards another 50 shows. How are you doing, Tanya? Uh, I'm Now I'm embarrassed because you said beautiful in my name in the same sentence, but that's okay. It's been a long, quiet summer, Brian, with hardly any right time recording recordings. I still can't believe we've already recorded 50 shows, and I am excited to kick off what's turning out to be a full slate of fall recordings. Uh, we're starting today with a brand new picture book by a first-time picture book author. And as you know, this interview has a lot of my favorite things. Uh, it has Working With You, it has two guests from Maine, and it has a book with sea creatures and a main character learning how to better understand people, which is a lifetime project of mine as well. What a delicious way to welcome fall. Brian, can you help me welcome everyone to the show so that we can dive in? I'm super excited to do this as always, especially with a first time author. Megan Wilson Duff wanted to be a marine biologist when they were younger, but somewhere along the way, they got distracted by trying to figure out people and they became a psychologist. Now they write books for children. How Are You Verity, illustrated by Taylor Barron and released by Imagination Press in August 2023, is their first published book. They are a faculty member in the Psychology and Community Studies program at the University of Maine at, oh, I might mess up this word, Machias? Machias. Machias. Oh my God, first time I've heard that. I'm so sorry. Machias. Prior to teaching, they worked as a child and family therapist and adolescent addictions treatment provider. Megan is a member of the Society for Children's Books Writers and Illustrators, SCBWI, Maine Writers and Publishing Publishers Alliance, MWPA, and a Schweitzer Fellow for Life. I hope I want to be a Schweitzer Fellow for Life. That sounds like a good title. They're a Maine Writing Project teacher consultant too. Woo! and part of the National Writing Project's Writing Council, Writers' Council. You can visit and learn more about her at MeganWilsonDuff.com. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Kate Dickerson is the Executive Director of the Maine Discovery Museum. With three floors of interactive exhibits and robust STEM programming, Maine Discovery Museum is critical in helping Mainers learn, especially in science, technology, engineering, and math. It is also a place I spent a lot of time when my daughter was little. Prior to heading up Maine Discovery Muse Museum, Kate was the founder and director of the Maine Science Festival, the first and only science festival held north of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Kate's also the founder, host, and executive producer of the Maine Science Podcast. Each episode of that is a conversation with a Mainer who is working in science, engineering, technology, and innovation. Prior to funding the Maine, founding the Maine Science Festival, Kate worked in energy and environmental field for more than 20 years and has expertise in the areas of environmental policy, pollution prevention, and environmental cleanup with positions in Providence, Rhode Island, Seattle, Washington, and the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center at the University of Maine, focusing on policy work. And Brian, I can't believe you didn't know how to say Machias, because I don't know if you know, that was where my first teaching job was. I had no I idea. I also don't know if you know that Kate um, is my good friend, good longtime friend, and we um, our friendship was sort of bonded over a love of podcasts. So, That's so awesome. I had to have her as our interviewer for Megan, and I'm so glad that you and Megan both said yes and that you're here. Um, I'm super excited. This is going to be a great, great conversation. It is going to be a great conversation. Before we kick off the conversation, though, as we always do, Kate, 
I would love to have you share a writing prompt. We won't stop and write, but if listeners or viewers could pause their podcast here if they were inspired to do so. I would be delighted. And, and thanks for having me. I'm, I'm pretty excited about this, um, have this conversation. The write-in prompt is, have you ever been confused by a question that people have asked you? Choose one time. What happened? What did you do? Excellent. That might uh, be one of the heavier questions we've ever had. I have to think about that for a little bit. I love it. I, if we were having a writing writers institute right now, I have a feeling that would like lead the entire summer, and we'd be talking about this question every day from that point on. Have a great conversation, and we'll be back in a little while. Thank you, Megan. It is a delight to talk to you. Um, I I'm just going to dive right in. I hope you don't mind. My first question um, is, I was, I'm curious about when did figuring out people capture your attention more than figuring out sea animals? <laughs> I think I enjoyed learning about sea animals and had to figure out people was sort of the way it worked. But um, Verity, the, the character in the story and the predicament that Verity's in is basically based on me as a little kid. Um, I think I would overthink everything and get told I was overthinking everything, but things that were obvious to a lot of people weren't always obvious to me, or maybe I knew I was supposed to do it, but I didn't understand why. So I was one of those kids who kept on asking questions. Um, and actually, this is sad, and my mom's not going to want to hear this, but I was actually told um, probably not to become a marine biologist when I was younger. <laughs> um, and so I kind of drifted away, and in school and college, I decided to go the route of social sciences and then I moved from anthropology to psychology. So hopefully that answers the question. Oh, anthropology to psychology is a super interesting, um, it's not quite parallel, but it's a really interesting uh, connection, I think. It was, it, it was great to go through a program with a familiarity with a different discipline because I was asking questions and the professors were like, wait, what? Because I'm asking them from a much different angle than most students are. But I, I mean, now I work in a, uh, the psychology and community studies program in which I teach is not a traditional psych program and includes other social sciences and real applied, you know, what does this look like in the community, you know, with real world, real world problems. And so it's, it draws on my background. Like, I'm quite happy here. <laughs> That's excellent. So, uh, you know, in the, in the book, you said, first of all, it's, it's based a little bit on you, which I was I was curious about when I read it. It seemed like it was uh, someone who had experienced an awful lot. Um, it, it, that came through, I think, to me as, as someone who, who read it. But we are we are absolutely in a time that's far more open about discussing neurodivergence um, than I would you know, even five years ago, I'm not even sure that word rolled off anybody's tongue, except for people who were really involved in, in the field. But there's still so much more understanding that we can do. Do you have any recommendations for other books that might help people kind of get what neurodivergence is? Um, you know, either kids books or grown up books, because I, I think it's, I think it's, a, it's still unknown to so many people where to even start to look. I do. I do. I have suggestions. Um, so there's probably many places, but two sort of front doors that I would recommend. Um, if you're interested in children's literature, um, I can't tell you all the people, but I think of Sally Pla might have been one of the people to start it. And she's an author, um, a, an autistic author, and she started a novel mind along with Adriana White and somebody else, but a novelmind.com. And it's what they do is keep a nice database of children's literature that you can search. So you can say, you know, ADHD or experience of anxiety or pick different filters and kind of in the um, also the type of book, picture book, middle grade, young adult, and you can select for it and get a list. So that's a nice resource that I actually just direct people to pretty frequently. And neurodiversity is a very, encompasses a lot of differences, obviously, like the idea that there's a great variety of, of people with, um, so I sort of describe it in the book. I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about if it's brains or minds, because it encompasses how we move and how we communicate and how we think and, you know, perceive things and senses. Uh, so it's a, it's a much bigger um group of differences but if you wanted to sort of zoom in on autistic experience specifically 
Uh, there is a blog, which I will be able to give somebody the uh, link to, but I don't quite have it. It's the Autistic Authors Project, and that's one where um, somebody curates and, and takes and posts. So that could be adult um, fiction, nonfiction, kid lit, more academic books. And that's another resource. If you're specifically looking for books that are either by autistic authors, they might not always be about autism, but that's another sort of angle to approach it at. Because I think part of it is making sure that whether we're talking about authors or people researching in different fields, that when we're thinking of experiences from within communities, we're listening to people from those communities describe them instead of not just being, instead of not being described from outside. I think I said that wrong. Instead of being- No, nope, I totally, you got it. Outside the community. So this is, um, uh, this is the time of the evening that I am usually sort of like <laughs> half awake. So I'm doing- No, no, I, it's, I, <laughs> I totally understand. So I'm curious what, this is your first picture book. Yes. And, and I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and uh, assume that you've written many other things, if, if only for your, your actual academic work, right? So it's a totally different approach. Yes. What, what inspired you to do this now? Like this podcast, me writing Kidlet was a something that happened during the pandemic. Where it, I don't, I don't know about Tanya and Brian, but for me, I needed another outlet. I needed um, to meet another group of people and interact. I wanted to learn something new. I needed something that kind of, you know, um, was a creative outlet. And because I did the teacher consultant courses with our regional national writing project, main writing project. Um, I had had an experience in a crit group. I had worked with teachers, other teachers, because I teach as well. And, you know, we had we had been in a crit group together and we had, um, you know, done teaching demonstrations together. And I loved it because it was so wonderful to be with other people that they're there because they want to be there excited about this stuff. And so I joined SCBWI, which is sort of the professional organization for people in Kidlet. And wanted to learn more about writing Kidlet, but also find that community piece. And um, they have discussion boards. And I went on those discussion boards and asked who needed a crit group because I wanted to join one or start one. And the people that I met, you know, sort of at the earlier in the pandemic, we've been together for several, you know, several years now. And they've been my regular monthly crit group. So um, that's how I made the leap. And I, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, if I'd be writing kids books, I would be like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to do that. So um, it's interesting to think about that trajectory, but the National Writing Project courses were really important to me because I, even though I muscled my way through a doctoral program and I've always sort of thought of myself as a good student, did not like writing and didn't feel very successful at it. And I actually got asked to go to a remedial writing workshop at the beginning of grad school. So, um, you know, I've come a long way in that sense. Well, it's, I mean, my experience with the book certainly didn't, um, I didn't get the impression it was someone who did not like reading. I was, it's so much fun to read kids' books as an adult or because, well, first of all, you can get through really fast. So you don't have to wait to find out how it ends, right? You're like, oh, this is great. But it, there's a joy in kids' books often, um, and some of it I think is because of the illustrator, but some of it I think is is just how you're conveying the message. So, all of which is my point of saying you, you probably if you didn't think of yourself as a good writer, this type of writing has to have been so different from what you have trained to do. How hard was it, or what was it something you could just dive into as a, a pandemic project? Um. <laughs> I thought I'm going to start with picture books just because, you know, it kind of feels like the beginning, although we could talk about board books. Um, and and they're shorter, so they don't seem as scary as, you know, 60,000, 90,000 words. And then I get in there and realize, oh, no, picture books are like poetry. They're all about concision. You have to compress a lot in there. Like, what am I doing? So, um but again, my in my mind, it was about this is this is a this is a challenge. I'm trying to learn something new, and if I'm uncomfortable with it, keep on doing it because this particular thing, especially when you're an adult and you're a teacher and you're used to knowing what to do, you know, having that thing that stretches you that makes you remember what it's like to kind of not even know if you've written it very well and not have enough experience to know the form and have to 
reach out to people and take feedback and really sort of listen and think about what that means. Like, so anytime I felt that feeling inside me where I'm like, oh gosh, I'm horrible at this or something, I sort of got my teacher brain going and encouraged myself. And I don't really have as much of that anymore. I mean, it's um, somewhere, somewhere along the way, I feel like I got enough of a feel for the structure of picture books to have a better sense of whether I was on the right track. Um, and I love my crit group to, to bits. Like we, um, we all have very different styles and we know each other's styles. So sometimes we'll say, write more like Casey, write more like Janelle here. Ooh, you did a really good job of writing like Megan here. Right. Um, but like we've, we've built up a really nice, um, set of relationships and it's been really helpful. So I think I, I was thinking about this, not like, oh, I need to publish a book, but um, I really want to try this. I want to develop something. And I want those connections with people through doing this work. So what's super interesting to me about that is that all of the things that you just described about how it felt to go through that is exactly what Verity went through in, in the story. <laughs> right? Like, listen to like this later and see. you're trying to figure out these questions you're trying to figure out and, and then trying to like, did I do it right? Did I not do it right? You know, like the whole thing. I, I love the part with her older brother and, and him being like getting her right. Like I, th I have found often family for better or for worse really gets you sometimes and, yes. and it can be hard, but they, that's, then you always know that they've got your back and it's you, everything that you just described is, is paralleled in the book. Did you notice that while you were doing it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> nice observation and process comment. Ah, that's neat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what importance do you think storytelling has to our mental well-being? Wow, I got pitched a big question. People write books on this. Yeah, I dove right into that one. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't get any prep. I, for let me let me answer it from the books, the book's perspective. Like there's actually things in my life personally that I spent a lot of time reading because reading was a way to get to know people, reading was a way to like be alone but kind of be together you know it's kind of contact with an author but you never actually meet them but it's a reassurance that somebody knows your experience or or you can connect with an experience and there are books that I wish I had had when I was younger there are books that I wish that even if everybody around me was still saying why do you do that <laughs> or frustrated with me I could at least say somebody knows this do you know what I mean so I think about uh, I think about that with the Verity story came out very sort of hopefully joyous and positive, but I think a lot about, you know, what the cost is for not being able to identify or see yourself reflected or just know that somebody else gets it. And I think that's getting better in the kid lit world. You know, we're not there yet, but I think there's greater diversity of experience represented, um, a wider range of perspectives represented, and I'm I'm glad to see it. Um, but that's that's how personally I think of it is I want you know, I knew that this book wouldn't work for everybody, but I feel like if it works for a handful of people um, that aren't getting sort of that reflected backness in other books, then I'm really happy. Like that would be my goal. Did you, do you have favorite authors or favorite books that almost felt like a cheat guide for you of figuring the world out? When I was younger? Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I read so much of it hesitate to come find um, like one or two or three authors and they're all over the place. But I will say that mentor text wise as a writer, there's a lot of books that I like really love. So Andrea's wheels, um, sweetie about the naked mole rat who was a little, a little bit of a square peg. Um, that book to me is very autistic coded. I don't know if that was intentional um, by the author illustrator, but um, I love that book and I feel, I kind of feel like, you know, it's a cousin to Verity in the sense of um, just, you know, celebrating who that naked mole rat is and they really wanted to find a friend and at the end they find somebody with the same special interest and you, you know the joy of that where you finally find somebody who loves sea life as much as you do or um, mushrooms as much as you do in the case of Sweetie. Um, that was a book that was on my mind when I was writing Verity. I um, I like how both that book and your book use use 
fascination with animals and kind of what I would call scientifically fun animals as the gateway to talk about other things. It's a really interesting, um, it's an interesting approach. I get, it's also, you know, working at a at, at the museum, we talk about different ways to appeal to people and animals always lead, whether you want, whether you want to admit it or not, right? Like you just lead with <laughs> Why that. Why not admit it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's been really interesting. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, well, I'm curious if, well, I'm curious about a lot of things with this book and this is a total diversion and I'm just gonna ask it anyway. How hard was it to find an illustrator that that captured what you imagined when you were writing? Interestingly, because I did not know this until I was into the process, but um, when the publisher, uh, when Sarah Fell, who's the, actually the editor of uh, Imagination Press is the publisher, uh, she is the one who came to me with a, a bunch of people, I think, I don't know, four or five portfolios and say, what do you think? But she's getting my input. She actually is going to make the decision. Um, and I'm sitting there as a new author and somebody who doesn't really think visually at all going, I don't know, they all look great. <laughs> um, so she ended up picking Taylor Barron, but in the picture book world, it's a lot more common for the editor to stay between the author and the illustrator and sort of ask feedback from one and pass it on to the other because the editor retains control over decision-making. So I was a very well-behaved and we didn't contact Taylor Barron until after the book was off to the printers. And then I wrote her and said how much I appreciated how like the job she did. If, if you look at the actual book, there are so many different ways that she had to illustrate sea life and it's worked into the background. It's like, I can't, and it was just, a. I think I will always love picture books because having a story and an idea and then having somebody else sort of bring it to life in color and illustration, th that world, those characters, like the story is mine, but the book is ours. And I, it just, it's really, it's really fun. So, you know, in my mind, I'm like, could I write a novel? But then I'm like, nope, nobody's going to illustrate it. Sorry, I can't. <laughs> there are these things called graphic novels. You that can. is true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true yeah you could graduate to graphic novels um do you find yourself thinking about Verity again like another story with her maybe I might have written a few more <laughs> we don't know if they will be something a publisher wants but um I I I have to watch myself sometimes because I'll write I'll I try to write a new manuscript a month and sometimes it's it's deliberately Verity and Verity's world. And sometimes, you know, it could be, but I wasn't thinking of it that way. And sometimes I think if this wasn't a Verity story, could it be on its on its own? Um, you know, could it be a different child in a different world? And, um, but yeah, I think, I think Verity is a little bit more of a character to me that's ongoing, but so you might see more Verity adventures. When was Verity... Uh, thought into being let's see 2021 sometime maybe yeah, late so you, 2019 you've been living with Verity for a while right yeah. like yeah well picture picture books like picture books I didn't realize until I was trying to publish something how long of a process it could be um, for anyone from like writing to getting it to the point where you're going to query to querying to getting somebody nibbling on that query or that submission to having your book acquired and then once that manuscript was acquired it took 18 months and I've heard from people that that's on the fast end so picture books from acquisition to being released are sometimes two years I mean that's not that's not unusual so um it's a long process. I mean, even when it goes pretty fast, it's still a long process. Right. So that means you get to live with that character for a really long time and create new stories, at least in your head, that that don't go anywhere because you're still waiting for everybody else to meet the character, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because I, I, at first it was, I want to write stories and I want to learn a form. And then it was like, well, if I can write them, maybe I can get one published. And, and now I'm in this place where I'm writing stories anyways, <laughs> like, um, and totally overwhelmed by the picture book world. Picture books are smaller. They're spread out over time in terms of this process. So, 
Um, I've asked other authors, like, how many books are you working on at one time? And people, you know, answers anywhere from like, oh, six or seven to like, you know, 10, 12, 15. And I was like, so if you have any problems with organization, <laughs> woo, you know, instead of one big project you're laboring on for so long, you know, that's a much bigger project. It's a lot of project management of smaller things that are at different stages. It's wild. It's, um, I, <laughs> I try, I think about all the different things you, you, you have to do and manage an organization and having that many different stories going at one time seems like, like a, 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 a Jenga game of some sort, right? Like just <laughs> trying to have that happen. Don't pull so. that one out. <laughs> exactly. Let's keep that one right there. So, all right. You, you've alluded to this a little bit, um, that you've got maybe some other stories that, that could happen on the horizon. Um, do you think you would like to graduate either to additional kid stories or, or like maybe young adult? Like I, I realize the picture book thing might be a whole fascinating piece, but I'm, I, I, I'm also asking because you said, you know, you initially kind of started this because you wanted to try something new and, and challenge yourself and learn new things. And, sounds to me like you're really getting the hang of picture books and you might be having that settled. So are you thinking about pushing more or, or becoming a better expert? I still want to continue writing picture books. I mean, I mean, it. it's a fascinating process. And I just wrote um, an essay for somebody on, um, you know, paralleling the idea of undergraduate students dread of group projects but then here I have this picture book that is inherently a group project and I love it so it's like how do you bring the joy from that experience and like remind students that you know group work is actually a lot of what we do together and it can be really wonderful even when it's challenging I mean because challenge can be enjoyable um, too so uh, I've been thinking a lot about that but then it's also kind of changing the way I write professionally um, in terms of higher ed. Um, so I have a clinical background and I've been a therapist and I teach undergrads, social sciences in general, but then specific counseling related classes and then writing picture books. So I've been really excited to think about writing things that kind of blend these worlds um, and thinking about what outlets or websites or you know, who might want essays that sort of look at these things from different angles instead of a tr traditional research paper or um, that sort of thing. So that's what I feel is evolving. And middle grade and YA, I think I might get there someday, but <laughs> I think I'm still in like the six or seven year old mode. <laughs> I don't think there's any pressure to do that. I, I do have one other question. I, I'm bouncing all over the place. So I'm, I'm feeling I'm, I might be driving Tanya and Brian crazy with this. Um, you said you said this book was based a little bit on you. Did you also would you as someone who has counseled and been a counselor, do you think a book like this would it, did some of it come from wanting to have something like this that you could share with your patients or your families? Well, I haven't been doing clinical work in a while, but I definitely think of the kids or the adults because there have been adults who have said to me you know that's the book I wish I had when I was younger because yeah. that's a gentler way of explaining things and making me feel like ashamed of not knowing of not realizing um so not as much I don't think of it as often in the clinical realm but it does connect for me um you know but then you have to find the right book for the right the right kid at the right moment so yeah no pressure there that's <laughs> super easy well, I have major thoughts. I have lots of thoughts. First, I want to say, Kate Dickerson, uh, I love your radio voice. It comes across so well. So you should you should do other podcasts and plug the podcast that you do do because you have an excellent, <laughs> excellent voice for these these shows. And second, I'm I am just in awe and so inspired by what you're doing, Megan. Especially as a, a classroom teacher who's now also an academic, we started the show because we wanted to represent diverse texts and to let our listeners realize that there needs to be a book for everyone out there. But one of the things that you triggered for me during this is, is how therapeutic reading is and how having text helps you with your mental well-being. And, and I realized as a classroom teacher, I, I kind of gravitated towards the books that I knew would help adolescents to heal or to process stuff that adolescents go through. 
Um, and I just throw that out there to thank you, but also just to give you the invitation that we do need more of these books. And I think you you focusing on Verity is is a good thing that we're going to start reading more of, hopefully from you and others, because we do teach students like this and we do work with families like this and their tales have ne not been put in text form. And thanks to your illustrator into visual form too, because I am a visual learner, don't like group work, but I do like visual literacy <laughs> and I need these books and these books just help me to, to be a better person. So thank you, Tanya. Yeah, this is a lovely conversation. I was texting Brian throughout. Um, I want to thank you, Megan, for the two um, recommendations where people can find who are looking for other books um, for neuro to learn more about neurodiversity or to see themselves in books. Um, and we'll we'll publish those in the comments with the video so that people will have access to them. Um, I also want to say. I, I keep wanting to write about this and we have written about it a little, Brian and I, but we have talked to so many authors who say, I wrote the book that I wish I had as a young person. Um, urban authors who are like, every book in a picture book is a single family dwelling with a garage and a, and a car parked out front. Uh, black and brown authors who have had lots to say about the representation of um, of kids like themselves in books. Um, and I, I'm really thankful for your book. I told you before we started recording that Verity is kind of walking alongside me since I read their book and their story. And I, and I'm happy to have them with me and, um, to think about how they would experience certain things or people when I'm out in the world. So I really appreciate that. And I'm glad that there might be more books and that we might be able to dive into their world again. And um, Kate Bryan's right. You are a great podcast host and you are such a good listener as well as have this very soothing radio voice. So um, you're both amazing. We are so excited that we are, um, just interrupting everything to tell you how great you are, but I want to make sure, Kate, that you have an opportunity to um, take us out. I'm going to put our my screen back up. I want to make sure to take us out on a writing prompt because this is the writing project and that is what we do. So could you uh, give us something that we might write about after we experience Verity? Yep, here we go. Um, and before I do that, I, I just want to thank you again um, for this great opportunity. I, you know, I never probably would have picked up this book since my children are now adults. So I don't have an opportunity to read kids books that often. So I appreciate it. And uh, Megan, it was a, just a delight to talk to you. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. And, and also thank you for, thank you, Tanya and Brian for the invitation as well. So, and I'll come up and see you in Bangor because, hey, we live practically next to each other, right? I know. It's two in Maine, of my it's favorite places. When Next time I'm there, I think we should all get together. Oh, I like that <laughs> idea. Let's do that. So, okay. Write out prompt. Is there something that you are as excited about as Verity is about sea creatures? Have you ever driven people crazy with it? Have you ever found the just right way to share it. Write about all this challenge we write, sorry, write about this challenge we all face. Your writing could take the form of an advice column, a story like Verity's, or something else of your choice. Thanks, Kate. Um, Brian, do you have a last word? I hate to just jump in. And I just, I'm also, I'm, I'm going to throw this out to our listeners. Um, what I also cherish about this particular episode is we often have this idea of who is a writer and what is writing and we tend to lean towards literature um and not necessarily texts that are relevant to see loving um neurodivergent children right i think that we need more books out there that come from multiple content areas that have different purposes for the writing to achieve uh, different um, outcomes. Um, and it's, and I and I, I tell listeners if you if you have a really interesting book that you think would be a great um, feature for our show, like contact us because 
Um, I would have never known about Verity or this great work that Megan Duff has put out if it wasn't for the show. And now I'm like a fan. And now I'm going to be teaching it in professional development when I go work with science teachers or I go work with histor history teachers, I work with English teachers, or I work with elementary teachers because we do need variety. You know, I'm, I always say homogeneousness is kind of a homogeneity, I guess I should say, is kind of dangerous and heterogeneity is beautiful. And for too long, we have tried to pigeonhole everybody into this tiny little spot that doesn't really exist because the universe is vast and we need these vast stories. So that's my thinking. <laughs> Couldn't say it better myself, Brian. So I'll just close with brief thank yous. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, listeners. If you loved this story, I want you to know, or if you love this podcast, I want you to know that we, I met Megan in the Right Now Teacher Studio. So uh, she's there, I'm there, Brian's there. You should be there if you want to talk about books or the teaching of writing or um, problem solve your practice with other teachers. Join us there to also find out about things like the next episode of The Right Time. Um, you can also go to our website, nwp.org, where you can sign up for our Right Now newsletter, and then you'll know each month who we're going to interview and where you can find the episodes. Um, we really appreciate you being here, and thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. NWP Radio.